Stop when it's the first coffee. Yeah, it's nine fifty. Nine fifty. Six out before I spoke, which is when this is the coffee break, and uh, now. I hope that doesn't mean that the teaching is less important. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, so here goes. Right. Um, let's just pray, shall we? why the people of God went into exile. Um, is the, after, the, after King Solomon, the nation divided into two, northern Israel and southern Judah. Uh, had good kings, <laughs> whereas Israel very rarely did although they had lots of great prophets in both the north and the south that were seeking to bring the people back to God. Um, and so the nation was divided, uh, gave itself, to, particularly the north, to idolatry. And uh, by enemy empires. Uh, you have to remember that when you think when we think of nations today, we think of a political entity in a certain geographic area. It wasn't like that at this time, in what was then 
uh, sort of the Middle East, what still is the Middle East, but what was then the, uh, where so much was going on, uh, where the Bible is centred, and you had, and so basically you had empires that were based in a particular city, but then just used to expand across and dominate world affairs for a while, and then they declined as well. That was the history, and so the people of Israel had enemies from those empires around them. Firstly, Aram, which is uh, now Syria. Uh, so they were the main enemy for a while. Uh, Egypt was always there somehow, uh, because uh, that remained a great civilization, but that was in the opposite direction to the uh, southwest. And then you had the Assyrians, the dominant empire for many, many years. And the Assyrians, uh, in the end, took away the uh, people of the Northern Kingdom into captivity. When we talk about the captivity literature, we're not talking about that because there wasn't any. Okay, <laughs> the captivity literature c came later when the southern kingdom, Judah, was taken into captivity. And so the, 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 so the, the Assyrians, their policy was, and this was quite common in empires of that day, in order to stop sort of nationalistic feelings amongst the people they conquered, they would take the people they conquered and transfer them into another part of the empire. that happened in Stalin's Russia, for example, Stalin's Soviet Union rather. Um, and so people, I've uh, spoken in churches amongst the Crimean Tatars, which were basically Muslim people group, but we've got churches amongst them. Uh, and they lived in the Crimea. They were a minority within the Crimea. But in one night, longer in their own territory in the Crimea. So that happens today, and it's how it, and it's also, what, but it's, it, that policy was developed particularly during this time, and the Assyrian Empire would do that. Exile. Those people were lost sight of. Kingdom. Under Assyria, they managed to resist. And I'm sure you were taught about this when uh, uh, Sennacherib uh, he tried to in, in, invade and uh, Hezekiah trusted in God and they got wonderfully and miraculously delivered. But later, they also went into the southern kingdom, not from the uh, Assyrians, because they were a spent force by then. By the way, there are still Assyrian people around the world. I've, uh, they speak Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus would have spoken. Um, and I've, I went to an Assyrian school once. But uh, it was, uh, so the, the Assyrian people are still around. They haven't got their own country anymore, and they speak Aramaic. Um, but uh, Babylon had then s s began to dominate. Uh, that became the empire that dominated instead. And the, they took waves of exiles from the land of Israel, the land of Judah rather, the southern part, and took them into Babylon. They took the educated, the young educated potential leaders first, 
and then they gradually took others as well. Um, but some, a few, um, were left in the land and then mixed with another, other people from other nations who were dumped there, so that the, because the Babylonian Empire... Um, Till another empire came along, the Median Persian Empire. Uh, so that's uh, Assyria and Babylon would be centered in modern day Iraq, whereas uh, the Med Persian Medea would be, would be in modern day Iran. Okay? And so they, they, uh, they then dominated the Babylonian Empire, and they had a totally different policy, which was to return people to their land. So when we talk about the uh, exile literature, we're talking about the books of the Bible that were written when the kingdom were in exile in Babylon. Okay. At... because they were the ones that came back into the land. But those are the... Uh, ...books, but I hope I'll help your understanding of it a little bit as we go through. So Ezekiel, first of all. Priest. land of Israel at one of the most tragic moments in their history, which is when the Babylonians invaded. Um, it was a very wicked king called Manasseh, but the previous king of Israel was a young boy named Josiah who had discovered a record of the law of God which had been lost. And... Um, Ezekiel was born in the year that Josiah f f found the scrolls of the law which had been lost hidden in the temple. And uh, his parents named him, who would have been a priestly family, may God strengthen him. That's the, what Ezekiel means. of great international events, the decline of one dominant power and the emergence of a new one. A Syrian empire was crumbling and Egypt and Babylon were attempting to become the dominant power and little Judah was squeezed between Babylon and um, Egypt. Especially the leaders were taken into Babylon, including Ezekiel, age 25 and so he was a trainee priest would have come into his full priesthood at the age of 30 and uh, while in he became a prophet of God if you want to really help your worship read early Ezekiel. It's not the one we often tend to read, but I'll be going into it in a moment. But these amazing visions of the glory of God. Particularly, uh, what was happening in Jerusalem. Ezekiel was almost like uh, having supernaturally the modern day internet where he could actually see what was happening in Jerusalem, even though he was over a thousand miles away. Okay, and he could see exactly what was happening, and he told the people in exile...
lived amongst the exiles. Freedom. Respected and consulted by the elders who still functioned in exile, though the Jerusalem to offer sacrifices there, uh, but uh, the sort of elders and teachers and the synagogue system grew up while they were in exile, and Ezekiel was somebody who would be consulted because of his prophetic gifts by the um, With him, and uh, he he started he started first prophesying and explaining, as I said earlier, what was happening in Jerusalem. He saw when the city fell completely because the city hadn't at that time fallen to Nebuchadnezzar. He'd just taken all the young leaders out. see when that happened in the spirit and told the people in exile what was going on. We'll go through some of this in more detail in a moment. From chapter 40 onwards, we began to have this incredible vision of the whole thing being restored and people going back to their land um, and uh, new temple but actually if you read the details of this temple and we'll look at some of it later on in a moment uh, he thing else don't just just don't make sense rather when John was on the Isle of Patmos in the book of Revelation he borrows some of the terminology from Ezekiel Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Ezekiel didn't describe it coming down out of heaven, but he saw all these dimensions of a city like a cube and all those sort of things. And so Ezekiel's prophecies at the end were not literally fulfilled when the people of God went back into, um, in, into the land of Israel, though they were in part. In fact, the return was like, and we'll, sorry, I'm, it's very difficult, to, there's so much to describe that even though I'm trying to go through it bit by bit, if you don't see the whole picture, even the bits in it don't, don't quite make sense. So when they actually returned, it was a return that was a fulfilment of prophecy, but it was only a partial fulfilment of prophecy uh, because it was looking forward to, became almost like a prophetic sign of what eventually God would do. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind when interpreting these books. An extraordinary prophet. He, he, as he looked at what was going on in Jerusalem, he saw one of the leaders die. He, uh, uh, he, had, he had these almost like trance-like experiences couldn't be switched on to order, so it wasn't that they could suddenly, come on Ezekiel, tell us what's going on. It never happened like that. It only happened when the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was suddenly able to see. Offices making their impact very, very dramatic to the people. I don't know if you've seen prophecies that are not just spoken but acted out done it a few times and seen it a few times uh, but it has a real big impact and that's what Ezekiel had to do so it was quite a biblical thing to do 
At one point, he had to l- l- lie on his side while eating a very restrictive, almost starvation diet. On these bricks, because remember, they were working in the brick fields. Um, so there were all these bricks around all the time. That's where they were living. And he would make a bricks denoting the city of Jerusalem and lay siege to it in order to demonstrate that's what Nebuchadnezzar was now doing in the, in, uh, the, in the literal Jerusalem. And he had to act this out. And he had to act out that the people of God were suffering greatly from famine during that time. And he had to... Uh, a, with a sword and then chase it all around threw it up into the air and chased it around and this bit denoted those staying in Jerusalem this bit denoted those who have gone into captivity and so on and so it must have been quite fun to watch uh, Ezekiel at work you might say although probably it wasn't because it was so serious be dumb he couldn't speak he could only show people Uh, and just act it out his wife died at precisely the time that Jerusalem was destroyed to mourn outwardly for her. In your notes, the vision of Ezekiel chapter 1 is probably the most epic and dramatic theophany Ezekiel to our application of the exile prophecy, uh, books that they are demonstrating to believers today how all over the world in contexts and cultures hostile to the Christian faith God is still there mm-hmm. later came out from the north and a huge cloud with brightness all around it fire was flashing from within the cloud and gleaming metal in the middle of it then in the middle came four living creatures human like with four wings they have four faces of a human that's the ruler of creation on God's behalf a lion the king of the wild animals an ox the strongest of the domestic animals, and an eagle, the most powerful of the birds. And so they saw these living creatures first. He he, he said, I had a vision of God, but it wasn't God he first saw. Creatures denoting God's creation. 
Their wings touched each other, forming an outward-looking square, and collectively they resembled fire, with torches moving between them, a fire in the middle, and lightning flashing out of them. And then each living creature had a wheel within a wheel. Now, that expression has come into the English language. You know, people talk about oh, wheels within wheels, as if it's something sinister. It, it wasn't. It was just... It was just that it meant, because you've got a, a wheel and then an interlocking wheel, it meant that the presence of God could move fast in any direction. Creatures is within the wheels but then over the heads of these living creatures that's all that God had created the wonder of his creation is a gigantic crystal expanse a massive scale moved it sounded like the mighty tumult of an army when the voice above them is heard they let down their wings with full silence and above the expanse above this upside down walk is a throne <laughs> surrounded by rainbows of living color and seated on the throne is one with a human appearance gleaming metal from the waist up and fire from the waist down and it says, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. Of God, but the Bible is tentative in describing the glory of God, which we must remember. I couldn't quite describe it. And so... Translation of that into sort of modern English, the translation in the Bible, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Yahweh. So it's not Yahweh, it's not the glory of Yahweh, it's the likeness, of, it's not even just the likeness of the glory of Yahweh, it's the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. Okay? And that was enough for worship. Like this. It kind of looked a tiny bit like something that was ever so slightly like this, but that doesn't get even close to describing God. <laughs> the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. Then as you go through the book, the calling of Ezekiel God speaks to Ezekiel to be in an attitude of ready service and he was raised up by the spirit strengthening him and it wasn't a terribly it, it, in chapter 4 his commission wasn't terribly attractive uh, you'll basically go to these people you'll tell them about how terrible everything is and they won't really listen <laughs> okay <laughs> not terribly attractive but our responsibility is to do God's bidding and say what he tells us, whatever the response. He has come, even though they may not respond to him. He treated God himself. It was a convenience. A convenience. You know, this is... It's still around this sort of weird, unfortunate misunderstanding of theology that doesn't worship God but uses God as a sort of...
song, My Thoughts and Prayers. But himself. Law of God written in their hearts. Nevertheless, we can be hurt as Ezekiel was warned he would be. He had to learn obedience. And he had a scroll writing on both sides. Wonder why that is. It was a, that was the word of God to him. Probably because he couldn't then add to it. If it's written on both sides of the paper, he can't turn it over and add to it. But there also there's a great deal to say because scrolls were normally written on one side only. Famous chapters in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37. Um, the prime meaning of that vision is the restoration of Israel to their land, even when it seemed hopeless. Ezekiel chapter 37 is the vision of the valley of dry bones. But it's something that we can use prophetically today. Even more fully fulfilled... In the, in, in the new birth, a new people united in Christ, an eventual physical resurrection. Bones, which was eventually formed into an army. First, they were formed, bone came to bone, then breath was breathed into them, which refers back, of course, do you remember the first time when somebody was formed and then breath breathed into them? Come on, you're back. This is a new creation. There's going to be something really new. And so it was all these valley of dry bones. And I sometimes will use that almost a... a uh, ...in God's ways. So stage one, the holy, it says that the hand of the Lord came in Ezekiel. Where did he take him? To a valley full of dry bones. And they weren't even connected to each other. They were all disconnected. And, uh, and he saw them, they're very dry. Our world today, isn't it? And if we don't... How hopeless everything is, and we need to see that sometimes. This is hopeless without God. And then God said to him, can these bones live? And there was a sort of... Um, Beginnings of faith, because Ezekiel didn't say, no, they can't live. He said, Lord, you know. On, it's going to come. He said, well, Lord, you must be about something here. Lord, you know. And sometimes when we're sharing the gospel today... It sounds like speak, it seems like speaking to bones, doesn't it? People hardly have any response to, to it. But that required growing faith as he spoke out God's word. And the result of that was partial fulfillment. The bone came to bone. There was a rattling noise. I love the drama of this, you know. Imagine that he's all valley full of some dry bones, you speak to them, and then gradually they all start rattling as all the skeletons come together, which were previously disconnected. Very vivid prophetic language. And then, he, and then God, he said, now speak to the wind. This is like prophetic praying. He prayed to the wind. The wind, in Hebrew, remember, wind, breath, and spirit are the same word. And so let the Spirit of God come and move in this situation. The army came into being. Well known scripture in Ezekiel, which I'll highlight as well, is in Ezekiel chapter 47, he's seen the new city, the new temple, and then he sees this tiny trickle
Yes. That's the thing. <laughs> yes. Okay, yes. Just, just at the right time there, yeah. Prophetic coffee, Prophetic coffee machine, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it says, as the scripture is fulfilled. A scripture has said, and nobody can find a scripture exactly that says that, but the nearest one is Ezekiel's river, that from the people of God will flow this, water, this river that gets deeper and deeper. So, you know, if you go out, if you go out to places where the gospel's not known, you go out to land unreached people groups, you suddenly find the river's deeper there. Because the presence of God... Excuse me, I just get excited about those things. Because the presence of God is more and more there. I rejoiced in seeing a video a couple of summers ago of a place where, uh, which was previously an unreached people group and we knew the, per the only convert in that people group. You know, now we won't quite finishing him, finish him because I'll stop at your coffee break designated times rather than as a special place in my notes. It's the Lord needs yes, right. <laughs> and so Daniel, like Ezekiel, Daniel and his three friends were taken to Babylon in the first batch of exiles. Remember, the people were taken in exiles in, as exiles in several uh, large groups. The first took the young, bright, potential leaders. However, unlike Ezekiel, who was a trainee priest who was just left amongst the captives in the brickfields, a Babylonian, Babylonian university or equivalent to study. It was a great strategy for Nebuchadnezzar. He was a wise statesman, we might say, Nebuchadnezzar. Very cruel, but... The brightest potential leaders changed their names, so got rid of their old identity as Jews, changed their names. The best of Babylonian culture and education and promote them into government. Establishment. Of Daniel was to prepare God's people, the Jews of that day, how to live under a predominantly pagan government, which were which was antagonistic to their faith. of saying how people should live in a, sec in, a, in a secular or pagan world. Different from the uh, worldview of the people of God.
dominating. Uh, yes, we mourn the fact that the influence of the church and godly values is not what it was. own land, though that has other lessons to teach us. God, now it's people of God that often failed, but at least they were the people of God. Even though they gave it up and went to idolatry, their basic worldview, as Moses taught them, would have seen being a godly worldview. Well, that was no longer the dominant thing. By applying to, to modern governments of God, you're more accurate to apply Daniel and Ezekiel and Esther, as we will see, and Jeremiah to that context. And we apply that to, I've heard it applied to the land of Britain. No, no, that was talking about the people of God. Still able to be a force for good in Babylon. So that Nebuchadnezzar had to acknowledge who God was. So it's not that we don't anticipate having a... The earth and light of the world means it's for good and we pray for Christian people in positions of high authority and that sort of thing Christendom and st not in Babylon we're like amongst the people of God Right? You got that? Most yeah. of the world. It may not be a secular worldview like ours, it might be an Islamic worldview or a Hindu worldview. Some thinking is that if Babylon, if secular government becomes identified with Christian church, we get actually mixed up a bit. We'll answer to the, pro uh, to the problems, whereas actually, no, it's possible to thrive. It's the Spirit of God whether it's the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel, whether it's the River of God going, or whether it's Daniel standing for truth. The book of Daniel is to be. Own land since they came out of Egypt. Now they had to learn how to adapt and work in an environment of cruel pagan governments and remain true to the faith and indeed influencing those governments. Okay, so I, I, I'll go back to Daniel later, but I hope you got that lesson. Okay, if we can be...
Continuing with Daniel. Three, King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to unite his empire consisting of many races, languages and faiths. He was perhaps a bit insecure because often these dictatorial rulers are actually a bit insecure. Insecure, particularly because he had another dream that Daniel had to interpret for him in an earlier chapter. And so he has said, how do I unite all these nations that I'm taking responsibility for? And so he decided on building a massive gold statue, 90 feet tall and a foot wide. Interesting. Work for the government from these different ethnic groups, because many of them did. When they heard the orchestra play, they were to bow down and worship the massive statue. Anyone who didn't would be thrown into a furnace, probably one of those used for firing bricks. Ancient world to glorify some monarch. Tyrannical governments today often expect the people to unite around some image of them, and that's happening, that's happening today in the world. But um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, reply: The God whom we serve is able to save us from the furnace. But even if He doesn't, we will never worship your God or your gold statue. Gold statue. men walking around unhurt, forth looking like a god. And he called them out of the fire, no sign of burning on them. And Nebuchadnezzar there, that's the thing. Whether Nebuchadnezzar came a believer is unclear really. But even he worshipped God and said nobody from any ethnic group must speak against the god of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and promoted them even further. So there you've got people who were in a position of leadership in the nation wouldn't compromise. Well, the story relates to how the men are put on the spot, denounced and interrogated, executed, delivered, and promoted. The arrogant king is humbled, the faithful Jews are exalted.
hard serving the government in a position of responsibility. I've known in little mini ways, you know, having to, when I was serving on UN committees and things and having to defend government policy I didn't really agree with. I'm seeing. They refused to give glory to the government, which could only be given to God. Many, many believers have to face statist religion. There's an evil spirit at work in this, and Christians in most of the world suffer under it. It's not. <laughs> Thank you. 
half as well to Daniel, where you get all these visions of fearsome beasts and that and often when I'm preaching in different sec if I'm preaching in our own church a lot wouldn't be because they weren't brought up in British nursery rhymes because they came from somewhere else uh, and but the the point is no one understands what it means so you start speculating about what it means the spoon the dish runner over the spoon, sorry, I, it's in small, ah, oh, I'll put it bigger, yes. The dish, <laughs> the dish running away with the spoon. Round? I can't say. I don't pretend to be a student of prophetic, li prophetic literature. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Schultz, who was a Christian, Obviously, having a little go at a lot of the things that adorn our bookshops of what means what in this sort of prophetic literature. Forms of literature. It has narrative, stories, it has laws, it has poetry, it has proverbs, it has parables, stories with meanings, and it has what is called apocalyptic. Apocalyptic uses cosmic or otherworldly language to describe the worldly realities or spiritual significance. E.g. the sun darkened, the stars falling, refer not to the collapse of the space-time world, but to the startling and cosmically significant events, such as the fall of great empires. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. Interestingly, coming with the clouds of heaven referred to Jesus going back into the presence of God. We often interpret it in a different way. looking beasts coming from the sea, the sea representing chaos and disorder to the Hebrew mind, and the beasts become increasingly more grotesque and ferocious. Then in my vision that night I saw a fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful and very strong. It devoured and crushed its victims with huge iron teeth. Chains beneath its feet, it was different from any of the other beasts, and it had ten horns.
the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. authority over the nations echoed again by Jesus in the Great Commission all authority is given to me therefore go into every nation with the gospel Twenty years 70 times 7 and so on on for many, many your years, even though you go back into your own land. And remember, a tiny minority of the Jewish people went in back, into their own, back into their own land. Most stayed. Years of exile cease and Israel is back in, their, in the glorious land. They will have to plod through a long stretch of this troubled stuff we call history. Getting back to the land will not mean that the kingdom of God will immediately appear. Nehemiah rebuilt, he, had, he did that under commission from the Persian king. The Israelites were to live out their faith in a Gentile world under circumstances that would make it more and more difficult to do so. They had to count on the sovereignty of God to sustain them generation by generation, crisis by crisis. They also had to trust the power of God to control the flow of world empires as they rose and fell. God's agenda is never in jeopardy. Nevertheless, they were to be prepared for the long term. Even Christ's people today are not exactly thrilled over that word. Good discipleship. Not only Daniel, but Jesus himself has taught us better. He said, we will hear of wars and rumours of wars, that nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. But these are not the sign of the end. They are simply the things, how things will be in the present age. And it is in and through these bumps and jumps and lumps of history that we are to prove, hate, prove faithful.
It's the longest book in the Bible apart from the Psalms. Did you know that? Citizens of that uncertain world as a man of vision where most people saw only turmoil and uncertainty. He perceived the hand of God at work in the crises of his world and delivered a message that addressed both his own age and subsequent generations. A huge lesson which helped form his theology. Law cannot change the heart. As soon as King Josiah died, who was a godly king, the came back. The people hadn't changed. Even though Josiah found the law and said, we haven't lived by the law, we've got to start living by the law. Babylon will come, in, will come and take some into exile and destroy others. The best thing is to surrender a completely unpopular message to a nationalistic people. Time, you won't be destroyed. Just surrender. That wasn't popular to a nationalistic people. It wouldn't be today, would it? He won't rescue you. All the other prophets said the opposite. God's with us. We're the temple of the Lord. And Jeremiah pours scorn on that. We're the temple of the Lord. We're the temple of the Lord, everyone says. Not popular? <laughs> And Jeremiah wrote to them later what Jeremiah prophesied happened, but he was thrown into prison, his writings burned. Message. They would return. Eventually, aged about 70, he was taken off by some people fleeing the land into Egypt. There he eventually died. He had a terrible life, Jeremiah. Cultural and unpopular and suffered most of his life for his message. Family. He's a soul. Something else, please. Faithful to God, he ended his life as a 70-plus-year-old exile, but prophesied with amazing insights that are still coming true today. Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. Um, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Why did the people think or Zachariah. Huh. We even have that expression. We're losing it now, but previous generations. He's a bit of a Jeremiah, you know. <laughs> a bit miserable. <laughs> or you might say, if you read a different sort of literature, he's a bit of an Eeyore. You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> 
And that, that's, that's said in the same way of Jeremiah. enemies. He associated with people like tax collectors who were associated with the occupying power. They weren't just fiddling the, the receipts, they were the collaborators and Jesus identified with them. Hello? Covenant. He knew that because of the wickedness of the heart of man, external law couldn't change them, only a new heart given by the grace of God on his sovereign initiative. And Jesus inaugurated that new covenant and preached the same thing. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He was a man of sorrows like Jeremiah. Un but unlike Jeremiah, because Jesus went much further than Jeremiah with this message. And Jesus forgave his enemies. Jeremiah cursed them. Okay. <laughs> Jeremiah brought a countercultural message that nobody else was saying. Eleven. else was saying then he gave what was the prophetic message message sorry Jeremiah 29 4 to 5 and verse 7 uh, Jeremiah said the God of Israel says to all I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon build houses and settle down plant gardens and eat what they produce also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper.
His radical message was a new way of working for the kingdom. subculture in which we externally dress and talk differently, avoid certain gross behaviours, but internally we have the same values as the surrounding culture. E.g. believers may not smoke or drink too much or have sex outside of marriage, yet in their core beings they may be as materialistic and individualistic and status or image conscious as the society around. Rather, we should form a counterculture. This is the reverse of a subculture. We are to be externally quite like the surrounding culture, positive towards and conversant with it, without jargon and other, or other Christian trappings. Yet in worldview, values and lifestyle demonstrate chastity, simplicity, humility and self-sacrifice. He goes on to say, Jeremiah was a proponent of counterculture in Jeremiah 29. Literature. But it's a brilliant story. Actually, for the Jewish feast of, feast of Purim, still celebrated by Jewish people all over the world today. It's also a fun story. We miss it because we read it in translation. Serious and dangerous events, it is full of surprises and jokes. A moment in history of the great Persian Empire, yet full of humorous exaggeration. Whoever wrote it is taking the mick out of this stupid empire that glories in its own. Adjurations. Feasts that last for six months. It's a six story building. Even the names of the courtesans referred to are all joke names. We don't know, we just think they're ordinary Hebrew names, or not Hebrew, Persian names. No, they're joke names. Achieving of God's purpose, the rescue of the Jews, but also pokes fun at the foolishness of proud rulers and their stupidity in making decisions. How do we see it? It's, what's the nearest equivalent today? Something like... The Blackadder view of history, <laughs> or, or a bit more up to date, horrible histories. It's theology told with irony, satire, and humour. It's off horror and makes it impossible to read a story we wouldn't be able to otherwise able to read. They obviously did all this, because that's what you do. You have to. You have to, to live with it. Yeah. 
ruler over the Persian Empire, was a great figure in world history. I remember learning about Xerxes at school. But the, the Hebrew Bible calls him Ahasuerus, which we just translate as Ahasuerus. That would be King Headache. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <coughs> Did you know there was a joke book in the Bible? <laughs> Quit for his nobles, and then a seven-day feast for all the inhabitants of Susa, the capital city. They had very clear rules at this great feast. This again is taking the mick. The only rule is there's no restrictions on how much you can drink. a separate party for the women. constitutes a grave offence which regularly produces the most extreme responses. for the king's harem. One of these may please the king and so become queen.
was a key advisor. He got a job, top civil servant. Everyone had to bow to him. So furious, Haman influenced the king. Again, the king is simply manipulated by all those around him, not thinking for himself at all, to pass a law which cannot be changed. Oh, that's Lot. That all the Jews should be destroyed. Hence, the Feast of Purim. Horrified, Mordecai I put on sackcloth and sent word to Esther to ask the king to rescind the law. Esther said, he hasn't called me for a month and nobody can just go into the presence of the king except a special few special advisors. Key statement then from Mordecai, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. But who knows, you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. That Esther had to do, all the things she had to endure were in the purposes of God to set, set his people free. It's an amazing story. In the entrance to the king's hall, she would only be allowed in if he extended his scepter. If not, she would die. The king extended his scepter. What do you want, Queen Esther? And I'll give it to you. Esther was very wise and was not direct. In the east, you don't do things directly. He destroyed. She said... Indirectly, let me cook a ba banquet for you and Haman. So they had a great banquet. Let's eat first, leave the business to the end, which you do in the East. and then talk to him afterwards. <laughs> okay. And what do you want, Esther? Please, will you come to another banquet with Haman? If I'm so honoured by the king and queen, I'm going to two banquets. Lordy K, I got so angry you built a six-foot story high gallows to put, to hang Lordy K on. That night, King Headache couldn't sleep. Of his reign. <laughs> Do you see what this book is? Mordecai I had saved the king and he said I never honoured him what shall I do for the man I honour Haman thinking it was for him said put on a royal robe and let him ride a royal horse if it was in the US he'd say let him go in our air force one okay <laughs> said the king do that for Mordecai I mean this is crazy The second banquet, he knew something was coming. 
Esther, what is your request? Esther could save him, and he knelt at her couch. A man was not allowed to be within seven steps of one of the ladies of the harem. Was that even in times of terrible persecution, Have the coffee break. That's the program, as I understand it. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, all right. With culture, and I'm thinking of that the way I, this was put to me. It's not just engaging with our culture; it's engaging with many cultures of the world, and learning how to. Uh, function well in, multi, in a multicultural context where we need to understand different cultures.
things I've experienced, but this is something I read. that the rest of the world didn't think that way. <laughs> Only ever since I've been in America. understand a lot of the references. Borrow to Emmaus. As if to go further. What does that mean? On him to come in. Do you know the Nepali Sherpas in the East who take people, in, in Nepal, who take people up Mount Everest and things? Mm. Never told before how Europeans think. Though they are our colleagues, we've been hurt by them for many years. directly because they were guests in our country. Mm -hmm. Our culture, and that, nor that we were really saying no. We would have to leave our families without provision, often for a month at a time, causing great suffering to us and to them. If we'd only known these concepts about the differences in the way we think and communicate, we would have been spared pain and broken relationships.
So I used to go there and do training. Then I, because I started working in other countries, I never went back to India. Then I went again after 10 years. Ten years. Can we have lunch together? Fourth floor of a building. Everybody there. Okay, <laughs> without demonstrating it in any way. Holding my wife like that in public. and I was on a South Pacific atoll. I was negotiating the first loan that that government ever had. So I had to say when the service started. I thought I'd go, I'd like to go and see a church on this island. So I walked to the church and there was Nobody there. So, I, and then the one guy, there was one guy there. I said, "What time does the service start?" And I said, what time does the service start? Eyes <laughs> and said, when the people get there, of course. <laughs> 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 Mission context. said, oh, obviously the majority thinks so-and-so.
Santos. from because they set up an international church it was a strange thing to do but they did and uh, so I was t helping them move from one to the other and uh, this Around, how can I shock these people into? Supposing they're going to stay up late till gone midnight. <laughs> would have been if they got to, and so the children go to bed later then. How do they work it out? and certain parts of the United States t minority thing amongst the peoples of the world <laughs> and <laughs> any other brother to give you have an experience in the old days and sometimes putting your children to bed at, on a certain time was almost ta was taught as if it was scripture. <laughs> Where does it say so in the Bible, anywhere? <laughs> Reference to it is when they were in, my children are with me in bed. <laughs> well, they're all in bed, aren't they? Children to bed early? No. It's culture. Most of the world doesn't do that. Asians into our church. But they'd come.
all sorts of ideas about cell church were going around and we all had to have our new policy of how we did small groups. And uh, we decided we wouldn't have multi-generational groups. I, you know, we made that decision as elders because that was one of the things that some people were advocating. yourself a man you call Arby. Let me tell this story. And if you're talking to an older lady, you say... day on culture with some trainee pastors and I did the whole first hour telling these stories and many more. <laughs> us.
Culture is how we traditionally behave. It includes that. Dress, arts, taboos. Acceptable and unacceptable in the culture. A pastor who was beginning to have some Muslim refugees that they were helping with English lessons in their church in England. story it's because in the east when you're talking to people you go indirectly and you start with things that they are familiar with before you come to things that challenge their world view if I've known people in the east time said Jesus must have been a wicked man Relationships are organised and how society is organised. Culture and human beings, Charles Craft said, is similar to the relationship between water and fish. And inextricably immersed in culture. I didn't know I had such a thing as culture. <laughs> Bad. Realize <laughs> the limitations of your own culture when you encounter another culture. Because you don't think about it when you're in your own, when you're within a monoco monocultural context, you don't think about culture. Mind as the way of life of a particular society include its patterns of thought, beliefs, behaviour, customs, traditions, rituals, dress, language, art, music and literature. These particular systems of beliefs and practices are based on the assumptions people make about themselves, about the world around them and about ultimate realities. Cultures involve the world view, social structure and institutions that give meaning to life. Cultures provide people with the means of expressing their deepest feelings, formalised in ways understood and accepted by those around them. Very important, that last sentence. It is very hard to express feelings cross-culturally. was associated with how you express your feelings. People in our own culture are feeling, can't we? You, well, some, some people can, some people are a bit insensitive. But we can generally pick up how people are feeling and reacting. Yes? Something different. Weeping may mean something different.
We have half-truths and resistance to the truth. Some idolatrous discourse within it. Wisdom, talent, beauty and skill, completely without regard for merit. Believers, we're never as good as our right worldview should make us. At the same time, the doctrine of our creation in the image of God and an understanding of common grace, that's grace shown to all, remind us that non-believers are never as flawed as their false worldview should make them. into the Christian faith. culture which you can recognize from Pakistan to Tunisia to Morocco.
would call superstition. Otherwise. Okay. Guild cultures, most Western cultures traditionally, though, as I'll say later in this talk if I ever get to it.
posh. These the concepts of right and wrong, my rights, but also an individualistic approach to life and the gospel. was satisfied in that wonderful hymn, The Wrath of God was Satisfied. I believe that. I said, come on, what does that mean?
conditions, you understand, don't you? I'm not. Hot climate cultures, relationship is the basis of everything. Cold climate, efficiency is the ruling value. Does it work? I'd ask how his father was, I'd ask how his brothers were, I'd ask how his mother was, how his sisters were, we'd get all their history, we'd, he'd then do the same for me. Fifty minutes late. Relationship. that matters. And finishes. Mm -hmm. Ooh, uh, make sure I finish in time for you to go, I don't know what you're going to do the rest of the day. You must have something terribly important on. But... <laughs>
It's in principle when I get to contextualization. Yeah. So it's totally biblical, and Jesus was deliberately offending the cultural norms. Oh, I see. Yeah. Do you see? Yeah. Because he was showing that this woman, who was rejected by society, is to be valued. So I was dressed casually and Bobby where I was being picked up. various ways in the church. Please stand up. Let's give them, let's clap them, yeah? Context event in a Western context. Context event. So everything surrounding it has to be done right. My context events in Western culture are declining all the time. We still have a few. In our practice, we have high context events, whereas in other cultures, high context cultures, almost everything is a high context event. It depends on the context how you dress. Following assumption, the content of an event is as important as the event itself. Responsible for understanding communication. Ask you a question in the way that my friend just now did. They've not understood. But B, it is not quite honouring because it's hinting that I haven't communicated very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see? Holistically. I'm church time, leisure time.
to who they are and what they do categories. That type of analytical compartmentalised thinking is low context culture. More important than the context. By their recent achievements rather than by their inner worth. Cultures. There's those who learn best by story or those who learn best by principles and concepts and writing things down. others, even in Western culture, probably 70% of us are oral learners, not conceptual learners. <laughs> like to keep things intact, like you to finish the story every time. Lose lists of points, principles and steps. Not analytical. Use formal logical reasoning and store truth in written abstract principles. wrote it down in their notes somewhere so they'll go and get it and then they know it recipes all the learners watch it be done and then do it and if any of you teach, remember this, 70% of my congregation learn through stories. story, help the listeners relive the story and resist the temptation to over explain. I'll just run on to that quickly. Temptation involves thoroughly understanding the perspective of your hearers and the question they are, questions they are asking. It means not just understanding scripture, but understanding the situation of those you're reaching with that scripture and finding how scripture answers their questions, not how it answers yours. Don't good theological answers to are not the questions the people they're talking to are asking.
politics because they teach on the things that Interpret sovereignty as fatalism. Uh. <laughs> so God is God's sovereignty is not a disputed thing. those we're reaching as well as the viewer world view of the Bible. So if I'm preaching cross-culturally, I'm having to handle three world views. View, which brings assumptions to the Bible. View of the Bible, because reading the Bible is a cross-cultural experience, so I have to say, what did it mean then? Teaching and how do I explain that into their worldview? <laughs> Building a bridge from the scripture of the contemporary world in the context of where you happen to be. And he says, Some sermons are a bridge to nowhere. <laughs> Exposition, but they don't land on the other side. nowhere reflecting on contemporary issues but not insights not grounded in the word of god <laughs> to challenge the real strongholds in the culture raised up against god because we look at it through our world view I was taught, I used to do stronghold seminars across the world and I remember first teaching on my, teaching on strongholds in an American context.
Bible itself. Leaving Jews, how did he preach? He said, he gave a summarised version of the Old Testament reinterpreted in the light of Christ. peasant community in Lystra, which were rural farmers, to Zeus, the chief god. And he applies that to our God. Idolatry challenges it, but indirectly by referring to the fact that God is greater and can't be reduced to something made with hands. Favourite heritage stories when an unknown God saved them from a plague. poets and Athenian heritage stories and says these are fulfilled in Christ. God, Paul, that's Paul's account of what he preached, which we get when he's talking to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. But also, though he described the whole plan of God, though he dealt with idolatry, though he set many free from demons in most remarkable ways, though he did work in such a way that people stopped buying models of the goddess from the shops. Interestingly, is that Paul had not engaged in specific defamation of Artemis, Artemis Diana, the patron goddess of Ephesus. This is not even a claim Paul makes for himself, but is stated in his defence by the city clerk to pacify the riot fermented against Paul and his friends. Nor blasphemed our goddess. Was uncompromisingly effective, but not calculatingly offensive. in style is culturally dependent. So for example, Need to see.
as church. People from Africa and other anxiety security cultures, but also for postmoderns or for millennials anyway, law guilt is not as strong as it was. And there certainly is less of a concept of sin. Anyone notice that? Allied yeah. choices rather than the sin. more in the sense of actions and doing wrong because there are far worse people out there. <laughs>